Okay, real quick, I just want to do a quick video going over an expansion on the previous video, which was Preds and Quantifiers. This is going to be a video going over what happens when you have multiple quantifiers in a single statement, and another expansion upon that when you have alternating types of quantifiers in a single statement, because the way we handle those are kind of different. So let's go ahead and hop on over to it and figure it out. So it's called nested quantifiers. Reason being so is because you nest quantifiers into a single expression. All right. So what are they? So in logic, if an expression has free variables, then it's considered a predicate. So we cannot apply a truth value directly to it. So again, to get around this, we just use our quantifiers. We went over universal and existential previously. Now, any single predicate that utilizes multiple quantifiers is said to have nested quantifiers. Now, the easiest type to deal with are same types because there's no confusion upon what's happening. So in this case, we can take a look at this universal x, universal y, m of x, y can be expressed in English as everyone sent an email to everyone. So that's not going to be too hard. And then if we change that to existential, then that just means there is a person who sent an email to someone. And again, these aren't going to be too hard. We're going to get a truth table from this pretty easy. And we'll actually do that later. But at the end of the day, same types, pretty simple. So here are a few examples. Let's take a look. So we have universal x, universal y, and this top one. And we have x times y equals 1. So what this is saying is that every single thing that we plug in here should equal one. If we have anything that doesn't, then it ends up being false. So let's see. I mean, obviously we can have one. One times one equals one. I mean, that's one instance of it. Uh, but we need every single possible instance to be equal to one. So the easiest thing to do with a same type nested quantifier would be to try to disprove it. So let's just do, also assume the domain is all positive integers. Well, actually, no, it's going to be all integers for later on stuff. So just all integers. Uh, let's see. So zero times one. And if we do this, we get zero, which breaks this. So this one's false. Now, for the existential, we just did it. We just did one times one equals one. And this is sufficient prove this is true. There is at least one combination of x and y that would satisfy this. So we have 1 times 1 equals 1. So existentially the statement is true. Now moving on to these more complex ones. We have existential x, existential y, x plus y equals x conjoined with y is not equal to 0. Now let's take a real quick look at this. So we have a conjunction. So that means if either side here or here is false, then the expression is false. Okay, I'm gonna clear these up real quick. Now, it's very easy to tell when the right side is gonna be false. So y is not equal to zero. So anytime that it is equal to zero, then this side's false. So it means that we cannot have y be equal to zero. Because anytime we set it, even though it might do something on this left side, it is going to set this right side to false, thus nullifying the entire statement. Now let's take a look on this left side. So x plus y equals x. And this is where that kind of right side caveat comes into play because we can set this to maybe 3, right? Well, if we satisfy the left side, I mean, if we satisfy the right side, then that means y can equal to 0. So let's try 1. So 3 plus 1 equals 3 doesn't work. So the left side will be false. The only time the left side can be true is 5. Plus 0 equals 5 because x plus 0 will always do with x. That means this side will always be true. But every time the left side is true, the right side will be false. And then every time the right side is true, the left side will be false. So no matter what, we are going to be guaranteed a false on one side. So there is never going to be an instance where this expression is true. So existentially, it's false. Moving on to the bottom here. Uh, this is disjunction. 
on universal quantifiers, universal x, universal y. x plus y is 9 to x, disjoint with y equals 0. Uh, this one's a little bit easier, so anytime that y equals 0, this is going to be true, and then we don't have to care about the uh, left side at all because it's disjunction with true. So every time y is equal to 0, true. Let's take a look at this side. So x plus y is not equal to x. So let's just do. Let's see what happens when we do zero. So uh, let's do five again. So five plus zero. It's not equal to five. Well, that doesn't work. So this side's false. But we know that every time it's zero, this side's true. So let's try it whenever the right side's false. So that means let's do y equals one. Five plus one. It's not equal to 5, so that means the left side is true. So at some point, every time the left side is true, right side is false. Every time the right side is true, the left side is false. So we're always going to end up with the true on one side, and with disjunction, that means we get true. So we should end up with a combination of false, true, false, true. And we do. So that's that same side nested. It's really not too bad. Um, it, it's mostly just a little bit tedious but compared to alternating it's not too bad so speaking of alternating we have the concept of what is called a two-player game so two players are alternating quantifiers which would be if you had existential x universal y something like that compete to set the statement's truth value variables are set from left to right so we had universal or existential x Universal y, x tensile side would go first, universal side would go second. Okay, so x tensile player selects the values for x essentially bound variables. Their goal is to try to make the expression true. And while universal player selects values for universally bound variables and they try to make the expression false. So, in our example here, we have the domain as all integers. Then we have universal x, x central y, y squared equals x. So, we're going here on the right side, you're going to see the rules that follow, so how do we prove this? So universal player, its goal, it goes first because it's on the left side. It is going to try to set the entire thing false. So it's going to try to create a situation where our x central player can never win. So what it does is it's going to select 13. So that gives us y squared equals 13 based off this. Now, the x player cannot find an integer y such that y squared equals x. It's again domain, it's going to specify integers, therefore we cannot do something like the square root of 13 doesn't work. So there's nothing that we can plug in here to make this true ever. So, universally, it is false. Now, on this bottom one, we have existential player going first, universal player going second. So it wants to try, and by it, I mean the existential player, x, wants to try and set the entire thing true. So it's going to do x equals 0, which will give us 0 plus y equals y. You can just simplify that to y equals y. Now, there is nothing that the universal player can do to ever change this is always going to be true therefore the existential player wins so existentially it is true now for examples here we have these two are identical except for the quantifiers are swapped in place here and it's going to change things a little bit so let's go ahead and start so this top one Universal x, x central y, x times y equals 1. We're going to have the universal player go first because again it's left to right. So it wants to try and set this to always be false. So all it has to do, 0, or any value actually. And no matter what the x central player does, it will never get a 1. So, this one's false. Now, Firstly, we have x central player is going to try to set this true, so we're going to do 1, y equals 1. And then the universal player is going to try and set it false, and it's just going to set it to 5, which breaks it, so it 
is also false. So the top two can never be true because the second, well, the universe player will always win by setting it to false. The first one by setting it to a state where the excellent player can never get it to be true. And then the excellent player is going to try and set it true, but the universe player will always choose to set it to be false. Now, x central x universe y, x times y equals y. Very similar to the second one. Only difference is that the one is now a y. So same thing's gonna happen. We're going to have the exchange player go first. It's gonna set to one. So we end up with one y equals y. Substitute that, or simplify that to y equals y, and now no matter what the universal player plugs in, it is always gonna be true. So this time, the exchange player wins, and we have it true. Uh, this is supposed to be x squared. My bad. And then we have universe x, x to y, x squared equals y. So universe player is going to go first. And I'm just going to choose 2. 2 squared is 4, which will give us 4 equals y. And now then x to player is just going to set its y equal to 4. And that's true. So we end up with false, false, true, true. So that's not too bad once you understand how things work, but without the two-player game concept, it becomes very, very confusing on how this actually works. Now, just like everything else we've gone over, De Morgan's Law applies here too. So if we take a look at it, we have negation of the universal x, universal y, p of xy is logical equivalent to uh, existential x, existential y, negation of a predicate. So same thing happens when we have negation, we end up flipping our quantifiers. So we have universal x, x central y. Now we have x essential x, universal y, and the negation gets applied to the predicate. So again, De Morgan's has a very, very similar concept no matter what you're doing. If it's just a basic propositional operation, if it's just a singular quantifier, or if it's nested quantifiers. So very similar approach. Now, the following slides are going to show some truth tables on various nested quantifiers in English representation. So, assume that we have a collection of people that are sending emails. So, assume we want to indicate that everyone sent an email to everyone. The statement universal x, universal y, m of xy asserts that every person sent an email to every person. This implies a sender is also a recipient. So our truth table ends up looking something along the lines of this. So we represent this via this. So Agnes is going to send an email to herself, Fred, Sue, and Marge. Fred will send one to Agnes, himself, Sue, Marge, and then so on and so forth. So they're always going to send an email to everyone in the associated group, no matter what. Now. If we want to express everyone else, that changes things a little bit. So this one says that everyone sent an email to everyone else. The statement universal x universal y, just like we looked at, asserts that every person sent an email to everyone per every person. To invoke the else part of the expression, we simply use x is not equal to y implies m of x y. So this implies the sender is not the recipient, so x can never be y when it comes to their case. So they can never send an email to themselves. So the truth table looks fairly similar, but now that we have this, we end up with this diagonal here of falses. And what that represents is Agnes did not send an email to Agnes, Fred did not send an email to Fred, Sue did not send an email to Sue, and Marge did not send an email to Marge. Though they sent one to everyone else. Not too bad. Now, moving on to uh, all the quantifiers mixed in with some existential here. We end up with everyone sent an email to someone. So the statement universal x, x to y, m of x, y asserts that every person sent an email to at least one person. This implies a sender can be the recipient. 
and we can end up with something like this. There's not going to be one guaranteed way of doing this since we have existential in play, but it's just every person has to have sent an email. So Agnes sent emails to Sue and Marge, so she's done the correct thing. Fred has sent an email to himself, and since it just indicates that you have to send an email to someone, you can be the recipient, and that's perfectly fine. Sue sent an email to Marge, and then Marge sent an email to Agnes. So everyone here has sent at least one email to some person. Now, same thing here, we're going to change to adding this else here. So everyone sent an email to someone else. So we just learned universal x, existential y. It's every person sent an email to at least one person. Uh, we wanted to actually express that it is not themselves. So to invoke the else, we simply use x is not good y conjoined with mxy. This indicates the sender cannot be the recipient. So you know with that we have Agnes still sent an email to Sue Marge. Fred this time has sent an email to Sue as he cannot send an email to himself this time. If he did, then the entire thing would be false. So send him to Marge, Marge sent to Agnes, and it's all good. Everything is sorted out and adds up. Now, more complex, we're going to have the expression of uniqueness. So we want to say that exactly one person was late to the meeting. So L of X is going to represent X was late to the meeting. So someone was late to a meeting. We need to express that X is the only person who is late to the meeting. So we're going to approach the existential part. So exactly one person was late. So it's that one person. We need the existential quantum part to indicate that at, at least someone was late to the meeting. So existential X, L of X, at least one X was late to the meeting. So that gets us the single uh, minimum that we're looking for. Where there's a universal part, exactly one person was late to the meeting. So this is going to be used to exclude everyone else that's not being bound by the existential quantifier. So consider adding a universal quantifier determining that person X is not person Y. The late person is not another person. So we have universal Y, X is not equal to Y, implies negated L of Y. So for every Y, if Y is not equal to X, then Y was not late for the meeting. So what we get is, just like we said, exactly one person was late to the meeting because we have existential X, L of X conjoined with the universal y, x is not equal to y implies negate l of y. So what we're saying here is there is a person, they relate to the meeting, and that everyone, if they are not this person, they were not late to the meeting. So let's just break that down a little more. The existential part is indicating one person. L of X is indicating that this person right here was late. The conjunction part is going to combine the existential part with the universal part that is saying that Y cannot be X. So they cannot be this person. And if they aren't, then that means that they were not late. So all of our Y's cannot be late. So basically X is late. And for every Y in the category, Y is not late. So it indicates that this is the only person that is late. Hence, exactly one person was late to the meeting. So that part is honestly probably the most convoluted aspect of nested quantifiers is when you start mixing it together with we had a kind of uh, conjoined aspect that had an exclusionary cause with a conditional statement 
on a negated proposition. So, I mean, honestly, the logical aspect there is pretty convoluted, and there's a lot of moving parts happening there. So, if that made sense, then pretty much everything else that comes about with predicates and quantifiers should also make sense. I will apologize, there are several typos on the slides, and that's going to get fixed up whenever they get published. So, if you notice some, I, I apologize, but it happens sometimes. But, hopefully... All of that made sense, and also hope we learned something, and I will see you guys in the next video.